great things seem closer than you thought and further than you thought at, at the, the same, same time. hundred percent. There's no perfect way to live your 20s. You either live them up and become an underskilled 30-year-old, or you work them up and become an underlived 30-year-old. You just have to figure out which you'd rather be, accept the trade-offs, and know that there are no do-overs. And door three, if you consider work, life, then you get to do both. <laughs> that one ruffled a lot of feathers. <laughs> well, it's because people look back on their 20s and realize that they are one or the other. All right, I'm going to lean into this. I, I am okay. I had a conversation with my team about this and I said, I am okay being a beacon of relentless hard work. I'm okay being the guy who says, fuck your mental health. I'm okay with it because I've given it a lot of thought. And I think that there is the other side is wildly overrepresented and I'm willing to sit on the logical extreme because I think it will help more people. And there are more people that I have met in my life who are dissatisfied by their live it up 20s than dissatisfied by their work it up 20s. Because most of the time in your 20s, you have no idea what you want. But knowing what you need to do to work and move ahead is fairly straightforward. And so you can take the known and make progress on the one that you have high confidence that you can make progress on. And then along the way, gain perspective on what are the things that are actually important to you in your life. And you may find out often that there are far fewer of those things than you really originally thought. Because what you thought live them up in your 20s was, was actually your mom and your two homies who are both mediocre and you don't care about their opinion now when you're 30 anyways. But what a waste of a life it would have been to, quote, live up your mom's dream or your friend's dreams to then only get to your 30s and realize you didn't live it up and you also didn't work it up. And now you have neither. I think a lot about, you know, the first day that I sat down at university, my first ever seminar, I sat next to my what would be future business partner for 15 years. So I'm skint. I say to him, I've spent all of my money partying during Freshers Week. The first week I'd spent my entire maintenance loan, which was supposed to be food and everything else for the rest of the term until fucking Christmas. And it's September the 29th. It was a big week. It, it, it was a good week. Um, which I could not survive now. And I think, uh, I think back to sort of the, the time that I spent and the endless hours, like, I'm not kidding. And I don't talk, I, I don't reflect that much on the, the club promo stuff, maybe to my detriment, I should do it more. Uh, I've spent between five and 10,000 hours stood on the front door of nightclubs. I've spent at least 3,000 hours stood on the front door of the same nightclub only on Saturdays, right? I didn't miss 202 Saturdays in a row. I took four-day holidays from Sunday to Thursday so that I could come back to come and do this thing. And I look back at my 20s and I think, you know, was that how much was living, how much was accumulating skills? And the grass is always greener with this because in hindsight, you think, well, you know, you imagine that you could have gone back and still accumulated all of the insights and the skills that you really value in yourself. That would have still happened, but that you would have got to maybe have more variety or you would have maybe the fun or the whatever the thing. And uh, when I look for me with my constitution at what I value most in myself, almost all of those things have been accumulated by having a 20s and now a 30s that has been dedicated to work it up, not to live it up, to four-day holidays in between those things. Now, remembering that now is not forever, I think is really important. Again, you're on the outlier right-hand end of the distribution for work. Most people are going to pull themselves back across in terms of balance between work and play. But you can periodize what you're doing right now 
you can accumulate all of that work, all of that experience, all of that explore time to work out. Actually, I, I don't like doing admin stuff. It turns out I'm really great at creative or I really don't like traveling. It turns out I'm really great at routine. All of those things. There's like a buy-in. You remember CrossFit? You do the you do a buy-in thing. You go, it's a one mile run and then it's this workout. You have to do that buy-in. Let's say everyone has to do that buy-in. Doing that buy-in when you're 25 is way easier than doing that buy-in when you're 40 right? I finally work out who I am in the world because you start to accumulate all of these better directional assistances. You're moving in a more directionally accurate way earlier, which means that you make more progress over the long term. So in retrospect, I'm glad that I did work it up 20s and I'm glad that I did work it up 30s as well. So I'll say two two things that are might be helpful. Um, one is, you obviously know my stance if you're listening to this on work-life balance, but maybe as a as a concession for you your work life balance obsession may just be too narrowly focused on the present and not extended into seasons and so you can have work life balance where i work for 3 years and then i have a more chill year and i think that most people think about work life in terms of their split of the day rather than their split of the year or the decade so and i think that you can have a much better outcome on both sides if you were to split it up on a longer time horizon. So good. I mean, everybody knows what it's like to go through it. Every January, intense period of diet, five, I fucked it at Christmas again, too much chocolate, too much, too much dinner. And you go, okay, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to work hard. I'm going to focus on my diet and my training for a while. And then I'm going to hold those gains for a period or I'm going to build a business. Okay, my health's probably going to take a hit for a little while. Or I just got out of a relationship. I need to go dating. All right, well, I'm probably not going to be able to spend so much time at work. Or maybe I'm going to be sleeping later. So my, my fitness is going to knock off a little bit. All of these things happen for periods of time. And yeah, remembering that now isn't forever is... And that's such a great frame, like a hyperbolic discounting and inability to be able to imagine that this is not the way that it's always going to be. And that's good for good things and for bad things. This isn't the way it's always going to be. So I better win, enjoy this win. This isn't the way it's always going to be. So I better not get too disheartened by this loss. You will come back. That's the the beautiful thing about the sort of uh, hedonic renormalizing. You go, good things aren't as good as you think they are. Bad things aren't as bad as you think they are. So if you if you use that extended frame as a way to approach different types of goals, so I'll, I'll break a, a very standard one, which is that people measure the amount of calories that they need to eat per day. The very few people measure the amount of calories they need to eat per week. And so people will blow the day and say, well, screw it. I messed up today. I might as well have a pizza on top of it because I had chocolate and I went off my diet or whatever. But if you have a weekly outlook even, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I can have a pizza tonight. I'll just like skip most of my food tomorrow besides protein. Or I'll have a wedding weekend and know that this whole week I'm going to be light. And so I have, you know, 13,000 calories for the next seven days that I can work my way through, which gives me a tremendous amount of flexibility. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that the further you extend the time horizon, the more flexible you can be with your achievement of it, as long as you only get the few things that matter most. And so it allows you to focus and prioritize on those few things that move the needle rather than be overly obsessive on such a small, narrow window of time that is irrelevant anyways. So there's a, there's a, coordination problem that happens when you try to balance too quickly when you try to have a little bit of fun and a little bit of play and a little bit of fun and a little bit of play whether it's task switching whether it's just sort of the cognitive effort of uh, your personality like your identity is i'm gym guy for three months right, yeah. hooray i'm work guy for three months hooray but when it's i'm gym guy this morning i'm work guy this afternoon it's tough it's tough to do that so yeah kind of the same as you get diseconomies of scale as a business grows because there's more interconnectedness and communication between each person the more use there are going on inside so this is an argument for sort of aggressive periodizing i'm a hyper proponent of one single narrow focus I'll define two more terms since the audience didn't ask for it. <laughs> Sadness is a perceived lack of options. It's why it feels like hopelessness because you don't know what to do. You don't know what options are available. You see none, which is why it feels like there's no way out. Anxiety is many options, but no priorities, which is why you feel scattered, but you can't decide. They feel very different, but fundamentally 
those are the difference in the conditions that make people feel like they're anxious or they feel like they're sad. And so when we're working through what you were just talking about with, okay, I want to be gym guy and I also want to be work guy, we have many options, but a lack of priorities. And so we have anxiety over the fact that we're not making progress on any of them because we have not been able to say, this comes first. And so if we think about what priority means, it means prior, it comes before everything else. And what I think a lot of people have a hard time doing is being okay with saying no and saying, okay, I will allow myself to just not get fatter rather than get fitter during this period. And what's interesting about most skills is that the amount of effort that it takes to maintain a skill versus the amount of effort it takes to grow a skill is like one-tenth the amount of effort. And so this is where the effort arbitrage is so important in terms of allocation. And so if you do a four out of 10 on 10 things, you will make progress on none. You will make the same amount of progress that you could have made if you just did one out of 10, which is none, you just don't regress. But the extra three points that you save on the nine, you could put on one other item and have a 10 out of 10 or a 13 out of 10 in effort. And then after every periodized chunk of time, have a big W or win that you can look back on and say, I did that and therefore I am. And so I think that that's how you step up the mountain of progress when you're trying to work on many different skills, quote, at the same time. It's just that the at the same time is over a year, not over a day. George told me told me this while we were on Mushrooms in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking brilliant. So I'm there watching. That's the hook. <laughs> <laughs> got, to, got to get people in the door. Yeah. I'm there. Fourth of July, uh, George turned to me and he said, general ambition gives you anxiety. Specific ambition gives you direction. Mm. There is nothing more anxiety inducing than I want to be better and I don't know what at and I don't know how. Like, just think about that for a second, sort of embody that. I, I, it, it's sort of a chasing, it's a lean in and it's, it's tight and sort of your shoulders are up and there's a ringing in your ears and you have no idea. It's like a threat. You've heard a noise in the forest and you have no idea where it's come from. Specific ambition gives you direction. And I think. The concept of specific versus general ambition ladders up to bundled terms. I want this big thing, but I haven't broken that thing down into what I can actually do. Once you get specific into the actions, you don't have a lot of anxiety because you can see what is required in order to get it. And so to circle the loop back on sadness, which is because some people who are listening to this may be sad, so this is for you. To get out of sadness, and I've been sad many times in my life, the thing that's helped me get out of it is realizing that a perceived lack of options is what causes sadness, not a lack of options, a perceived lack of options, which means that all I have to do is figure out what I need to do and figuring it out becomes the option. And so then I have clarity on the one thing that I need to do to pull myself out of this moment of sadness, which is, oh, I just have to figure out what to do. And that is how I get, at least for me, have gotten out of my sadder periods. Controversial take. You really can solve a lot of male problems by getting in shape and making money. You still have problems. They're just smaller and you have more resources to handle them. The world is there for the taking for anyone who can learn from their mistakes, do what they say they were going to do, and stick with it, even if it's not sexy. What used to make a man acceptable now makes you extraordinary. The bar for winning has never been so low. Show me two groups of men that need to learn a new skill or achieve anything where the men that are in shape and have learned to make money do worse than an identical group of those men who are out of shape and have not learned to make money. And it's a, it's a skewed purposefully test because the skill of getting in shape requires many other skills. The skill of making money has many other sub skills. And so the real question is, Give me a group of more skilled men and less skilled men, and I promise you the more skilled men will do better. Yeah. And so for anyone who gets offended by that, you're a moron. And so the idea is all men and women benefit from learning more skills. There is no world where being more skilled hurts you. What about the bar for winning has never been so low?
if you think back to college when you were a freshman, you think, wow, this is so hard or whatever. And then by the time you're a senior, you're like, man, these kids are so soft. And so we remember things as harder than they were. But I also think that there is a thread of reality, which is that the younger generation is softer. And I think we are softer than the generation above us. When I think about the guys who were storming Normandy, and I think about the people who would be attempting to do that now, as a class, I think that we are softer. And so the thing is, is that if you can barely decide to take any action at all and peel your eyes away from your phone for just a moment, it's so much easier to beat everyone else because most people are overweight, they're distracted, they're poor, they have so few skills because it has never been easier to start a business, to make money, to get in shape. It's just also never been easier to do nothing. And so in a world where it's never been easier to do nothing, doing something becomes extraordinary. Yeah. The bar genuinely never has been so low, which is, it really does blow my mind, sort of the self-defeating cynicism mindset. And I think also that's why the idea of the lonely chapter resonates so much with people because it, it literally is like taking the red pill. If you see this version of the world where you go, I can impact my outcomes. I can learn a thing, apply a thing, and then I change as a byproduct of doing that. As soon as you take those steps, you realize almost all of the people around you who have parts of their life that they're not happy about are kind of making a choice for it to be that way. Now, it may be an uninformed or an ignorant choice because they haven't taken said pill. And then you go, oh, fuck. That means that all of the things I don't like about me and I don't like about my life are my responsibility because I can change it. But given that you've got generalized cynicism everywhere, as opposed to thinking, I'm despondent, this sucks, I wish that, wish that the world was more hopeful, you can still think that and also go, that means that my competition has never been weaker, more vulnerable, more fragile. The ability to set myself out from the pack has never been easier. I think people struggle a lot with the concept that something can be both painful and empowering. It's this hurts, therefore it's bad. When taking full accountability of your life with all of the deficiencies that you have may be the most painful thing that you do when you look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is my fault. But in saying, this is my fault, those are also the first two steps of progress because it's my fault, not anyone else's, which means it's my responsibility and my action that can change that. And I think that marrying short-term pain with long-term progress is one of the first connections that most people who are on that path have to make. This is the lead indicator of what will be the lag indicator that I want. People get frustrated not achieving what they want because they assume that they're going to jump across a cavern in one leap. But if you picture your goals, like you're trying to build a bridge across that crevice and every brick that you put on that bridge is progress. And each one of those bricks represents a skill that you need to learn along the way. It just takes all the way until you get to the other side that you can actually walk across. And so the walking across is the outcome. It's the external perceived achievement. But if you can reframe your progress as what are the hundred things on this checklist? What are the hundred skills that I need, the micro skills that I need? Then you can have much faster feedback cycles of wins that you're achieving along the way. And I think if you can define it that way, then you can feel like you are winning A, more often, but B, with higher intensity because as you win, skills stack on top of each other. And so I give this example a lot, but I like it is that if you are, you learned how to do math, that's a skill. Great. If you then learn how to do accounting, that's a leveled up version of that skill, but you require, you have to know how to do math before you can do accounting. Once you learn how to do accounting, you can learn how to do transactions and structure deals. And then all of a sudden you can become a CFO. And if you learn how taxes work, 
and insurance work, then all of a sudden you become, and, and you learn how to raise money. All of a sudden you can be a rainmaker. But the thing is, is that the gap between rainmaker and I know how to do math feels very big. But if you look at all of the micro things along the way, you might not get your first major deal done, which is what everyone in the, man, he did that deal and made $20 million on one signature. Must be nice, right? And it is. Uh, but if you if you break those things down into the into the the requisite skills then you can make significantly more progress along the way and i think that is more positively reinforcing and i'm just i'm sharing this because this has been a perspective that has served me so well in my life because the goals that i have now take many years to come to fruition like i'm i'm working on a goal that in the next probably 18 months i will have been working on for 13 years and it will it will probably come due and the crazy thing is, is that the bigger your goal, the bigger your timeline has to be. But the, the even crazier thing is that the bigger your timeline, the easier it is. If I said, you just have, you have to learn French and you don't speak French and you have to do it by tomorrow, it's impossible. You're not going to do it. There's no way that you're going to be able to do it. But if I said, you have to learn it in a decade, you're like, oh, I could, I could easily do it. You could probably learn 10 languages in a decade. And so all of a sudden, the goals that you have can be significantly more achievable and you can feel like you're consistently making progress by moving out your timeline. But because people are so short-term minded, because they can't just stop scrolling over and over again, they actually make it harder for them to achieve their goals because the only goals that they deem acceptable are ones that are on an unrealistic timeline. And so they doom themselves from the beginning. How to avoid tons of problems in life. Go to bed on time. <laughs> So I love these. I want to find single behaviors that have many positive outcomes. So if you think about leverage as what you get for the effort you put in, if you have lots of leverage, then it means you can do one thing and get many big outcomes, right? Or one very big outcome. That's high leverage. If you put a lot of work in and get a very little bit out of it, you have low leverage. And so the highest form of leverage I think of are what's one behavior or one skill that I can learn that then has many, many downstream impacts. And so for, and this is specifically, I'll say for the 20-ish the year old, so 20 to 30, 20 to 35, if you can simply go to bed on time, you avoid drinking and getting in a DUI, you avoid early pregnancies, you avoid missing, messing up your work because you don't sleep well, because uh, you show up hungover the next day and then you don't get the career advancement that you want or you get the judgments from your coworkers from the fact that you're responsible because you drink, even though it might've been responsible drinking, but you still smell like booze because it's in your system. If you go to bed on time, it's less likely that you'll get mugged. It's less likely you'll be in a car accident. Like there's, there's all of these downstream impacts from one single behavior. And you also have better quality sleep in general if you go to sleep at the same time every day over and over again. So that means that you have life extension things that happen. You look younger. And so now five years, 10 years later, people are like, wow, you look so good for your age. There's all of these things from one central behavior, which is just fucking go to bed on time. And so if you want the action for this, you see set your alarm for when you go to bed, not for when you wake up. If you set your alarm for when you go to bed, you will always be able to wake up naturally at whatever time you wake up. And it's very difficult to oversleep when you go to bed at nine because you can get eight hours of sleep and still be up by five. 